two months ago yesterday, my son was born. And I became a father. Here he is. His name is Zorro. No joke. And he is helping me prepare for this talk. Uh, once you become a parent, what happens? You become immediately focused on the present, and you start thinking about the future in ways you never thought about. The problem is, for a young parent like me, the future has never been more unpredictable. Here's a stat I found in the latest forecast report from the US Department of Labor. Our parents didn't have this problem. Imagine the impact of such a shift across the whole of society. Think about the global nature of the job market now and what it would be like in 25 years. Now, how do we prepare for this? What is the role of our history in this type of uncertainty? What is the role of history education? Is there a role? Well, I think there is. I think history is our most valuable repository of knowledge with an amazing ability to help us learn critical thinking, with the potential to bring the world closer together, and it can even prepare us for the future. But it cannot do that unless we start looking at history in a different way and start engaging in a different way. So I want to talk to you about Transmedia his storytelling. That's what I call transmedia his storytelling. I want to talk to you about how we learn through stories specifically, and I want to talk to you about how we can better teach history in general. I am born to a father who was of the military and a mother who was a teacher. I come from an upper middle class, cosmopolitan, loving family, and I grew up in this lovely family with my lovely, supportive older sister. But nothing could have prepared for my, my parents for the life that we would have. I grew up in this, I was born in the States, and we moved back to Iran shortly after. Within six years, our lives were turned on its head. I went to first grade in the middle of the 1979 revolution. By second grade, we were living in an Islamic Republic. And by third grade, we were headlong into a war that ultimately killed a million people. Assassinations, arrests, bombing raids, and food ration lines were the new normal. Now, at the same time, I got my respect for education from my mama, who was an amazing teacher. She was actually my third grade teacher, but to be perfectly honest with you, she was really mean to me. She was so mean to me that half my class didn't believe she was my mother. <laughs> they thought we had the same last name by accident. God forbid I'd raise my hand and say mama by mistake. But I also remember that her classes were fun. They were amazing for everybody else. No, they were also fun for me. They were great. Because they were fun because she engaged us. We played. It was role playing. There was fun. We loved it. We loved it and we learned so much. But none of that was enough. How do you teach a nine year old kid how to deal with conflict and instability? You can't do that. No parents prepared for that. And my parents weren't either. So I found solace in comic books and novels. I started with a Tintin and pretty quickly moved to a grown up fair. I remember when I was 11 years old, I read Gone with the Wind. And after I'd finished the book, I was pissed off. I sat at dinner and I slammed my fist on the table. I was like, I just finished Gone with the Wind and I'm pissed off. I liked it so much. And my dad was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you doing reading a romance novel at the age of 11? <laughs> but it wasn't the romance that enticed me. Maybe a little. Maybe a little. But you see, Gone with the Wind is about the American Civil War. The story takes place before, during, and after the war. The characters in this story undergo total cultural and economic transformation. Not unlike my own family. I found in their story a way to cope with mine. So I wanted more. So I looked at other books, fiction, nonfiction, that dealt with conflict. And in them, I looked for meaning and understanding. And it wasn't until years later, where as a filmmaker and story architect, I started thinking about the future of my trade. And I started, and that's only then when I grasped how those stories really impacted my development. I started looking at science. People like Simone, who've done this amazing work in the last 10 years, that say what? That say that our brain responds in a very unique way, very differently to narrative design and to story. The whole brain is engaged. In fact, we are hardwired to learn through a story. What does that mean? It means that when we hear, watch, or read a story, our brain thrusts us in the middle of that story. Through emotion, our brain connects the narrative to our own experiences. Through these emotional connections, we learn more facts. We remember those facts. But that's not all. Through these perceived experiences, we learn critical thinking. 
and we improve our social survival skills, which is critical in now, now, nowadays, right? Because the social environment is becoming so complex. Now, you don't have to be a neuroscientist to understand these concepts. I'm not one, because we've all experienced the power of a good story. We've all been transformed by it. So here's the dilemma. This is the experiment. Here's the dilemma. The dilemma is that despite all the neuroscientific evidence, there is an entrenched belief in the formal education system and with academia that if you storify learning, you inherently dumb it down. You make it less complex and less valuable. Ironically, there's an opposing belief on the other side, in my side of the fence, in the entertainment industry, that if your stories are educational and factional, they're, less, they're, they're not entertaining. In fact, it's considered a death curse in entertainment. So that's a zero-sum game, if I've ever heard one. What does that mean? What does that look like? It looks like this. It's, it means that every project that's created in either industry exists on the opposite ends of the entertainment education spectrum. As a result, history, education has failed our kids, has failed to entice them, has failed us. According to two-time Pulitzer award-winning historian and author, David McCullough, our kids today are historically illiterate, literally. On the other side, historical media, at best, is a narrow look at a specific history. And at worst, it's a series of half-truths riddled with dramatic distortions. Now, there's a gap in the middle, as you can see. So, it's not a novel idea, right? We've taken history and made stories out of them, like most recently, Argo and Lincoln, Oscar-nominated films. Fantastic. And I can see how these could be used in a classroom. So what's the big deal? Well, they're limited by their form, right? And they, as well as they should be. They're a single narrative, and both of these projects are single perspective. Imagine if you could take Lincoln, which got so much attention, and you could have other layers of that story that told the story of the slaves who fought with Lincoln, the opposite sides who didn't agree with him, and that you could watch the film and populate the other stories as well and go deeper if you wanted to. Imagine if you could maintain the complexity of academic history while at the same time you're entertaining and immersive. Maybe then you actually mean what you do when you say, I want you to learn from history. Now, the funny thing is, you could do all this, and you see where that guy's pointing? That's where Lincoln would go, and that's where I work. I work at a place called Boom Gen Studios. We're a storytelling factory and a transmedia incubator, and that's what we do. And that's what transmedia is. It's multi-narrative, right? It's multi-platform, and it's interactive. It engages its audience. So here's an example of a project we worked on. It's called Ajax. It's about a coup d'etat that happened in Iran in 1953. It was backed by the British, and it was executed by the CIA. Poignant? Little known. The first product was an interactive graphic novel, won all the awards last year, done immaculately by Cognito Comics, 200 pages of original illustrations and story embedded with historical document documentation, including the CIA files, images, archival footage as to how it was being reported at the time while it was happening, and you can check it out. Check it out. It's on your iPhone, iPad. You can check it out. It's amazing. They've done a fantastic job. Second layer, starting the fall of last year, we put out the academic edition of Ajax. It's been in a pilot program in select schools in North America and Europe, most recently at the illustrious Military Academy of West Point in New York, to three controlled groups, and they're learning with it. It's a web platform that goes even deeper into history, even deeper in the type of documentation that it presents, the arguments that it makes, in the per perspectives that it shows, and when you go deeper, you find nice things rather than bad things. You find that history is an interesting place that liberates us doesn't hurt us, right? So here's some of the kids, 12-year-old kids, learning about the history of a coup in Iran. It was fascinating. We went to visit them. It was amazing, the feedback that we got. But I'm going to go right to the next thing, which really I find exciting. It's the gaming component. So the game layer is where we take all of that academic research, and we're working with a team of academics as we speak, through game theory, creating a decision tree that allows you to go and change the outcome of that history and experiment with it. Now, here's this pinball machine that my third grade friend had back when I was in Iran. It was a bizarre pinball machine. It has no paddles. And the object is to get the ball into the slots. Now, if you think of history, the, the trajectory of that ball as history, everything else is a possibility. And the game 
A game about history is a game of exploring what could have happened. If you want to really learn about history, that's how you do it. That's how the game works. You pick a side, and you try to enforce your own agenda against somebody else. And in that, you make this history personal to you, and you learn from the mistakes, and you understand the stakes. Because those two things are important. Right? Of course, we have a film. An animated future film, spy thriller, that puts an American spy on the ground in Iran to execute this mission, right? That goes into production this year. It'll be out in 2015. So here we have. We have a property that is at once entertainment and education, and we don't have to be ashamed of it. They're not mutually exclusive, right? And this can be done for any history. Just 20th century is a treasure trove for content. Now, who's going to pay for all this? Well, the good news is, at the intersection of education, entertainment, and interactive media is a massive global trend driven by massive market shifts. And we believe at the center of this is transmedia storytelling, and the nexus of that is history. Now, I'm not just saying we should do this because we should do it, and we have to do it if we're serious about this stuff. I'm saying we should do it because there's also opportunity. Remember this guy? What's out here? Out here is also opportunity. Out here is also a low barrier to entry. If you wanted to create straight up entertainment and straight up education, you'll have an 800 pound gorilla, 800 pound gorilla or five waiting for you. And you know what they say about gorillas. They make the wrong type of impact. So what kind of impact are we going to make? Right? By exploring the story of history, we'll bridge the gap between historian and storyteller, much to the delight of students, teachers, and parents everywhere. The three main stakeholders in this proposition. Through gaming and experimentation with historical events, we fundamentally transform our relationship to history from a passive, here is what happened, and now go learn it and take this test on the Scantron, which you and I had to go through, to an active one where you can engage it, explore it, and storify it. But perhaps most importantly, perhaps most importantly, through a multi-layered approach, through a multi-narrative approach, we can explore a shared history. Through multiple perspectives and multiple viewpoints, we can engage the world in a dialogue around that history, and we can truly have a shared history, a global history for a global age, which is the age we live in. Now, thanks to science, thanks to science, we understand the critical connection, and we're beginning to understand it even more, between story and human behavior. Storytelling, with stories, we learn better. We understand the world around us, the complex world around us, more intimately. I understood this as a child because, for example, Gone with the Wind helped me transform an experience that should have been dark and destabilizing of living in conflict and instability to one that was fun for a kid to be in. It also put me on a path of historical exploration that's led me right here on this stage. Right? It was transformative for me. And what do I do as a parent? I want to give that to my kid. Remember my kid, Zoro? Well, I hope to God that Zoro doesn't have to grow up in the kind of environment that I grew up in. If he does, we've named him appropriately. <laughs> but that's not why we named him. Maybe it was. But no, it wasn't. <laughs> I'm an optimist about the future. What I can tell you is this that I know as much about the future that he will grow up in as my parents knew about mine. In fact, I probably know less because the future is more unpredictable now than it was even then. And I want to make sure that my little Zorro has the same gifts of history that I had going forward. Now, I want to give you an end with a quote of my father's. My father taught me long ago that the power of history, the history's value is trapped in our potential to learn from our past mistakes and to let go of our grievances. Not to settle scores, but to heal. And I truly believe, I truly believe, as storytellers, we are not here just to entertain, although entertainment is important. 
Our responsibility, we have a moral responsibility to do more than entertain. We must become healers once again. And that's the gift I want to give to my kid. And I cannot do that alone, which is why I'm here at TED talking to you. Thank you so much.